Um, so I'm going to welcome to the stage now Dr. Steve Jones, who's going to talk to you about torture porn and specifically about the idea of the easy way in which we sometimes kind of interpret films based on the historical moment we're in. We make kind of easy associations sometimes. So Steve's going to talk about that. So Steve, if you want to come up, just to say once Steve finishes, then we'll have all three speakers in front of you and you can ask them any questions you want. So have a think about any questions you might have. Um, but for now, over to you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about torture porn shortly and also political allegory shortly. Um, before I get to torture porn, I'm not sure how well the, the phrase torture porn has travelled. Do many of you know, have you heard the phrase torture porn before and know what, roughly what I'm speaking about? Um, I'll explain what I mean by torture porn shortly anyway because, um, uh, as they say, I've written the book on it. So um, I've got a particular definition of it. Um, before I start to talk about that, though, however, I wanted to talk for a moment about... Um, the place of horror, the, the reputation of horror, and that, that's how we're going to get into political allegory. Um, horror, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a, a form that's often disparaged. It's often dismissed by the critical press as being redundant and unworthy um, for various reasons. One of the key reasons, I think, is that it's a genre that's associated with um, cheap thrills. It's a genre that's associated with sensation and being of the body. It's presumed that people go to see horror films uh, in order to... Uh, feel the shock and surprise of jump scares, as I'm sure you'll see in Under the Shadow later on, or the, the nausea of seeing um, bodies opened. And this is a genre that's associated more generally with the body and with bodily responses. Now, typically um, in culture, and I'm sure in most cultures, the body is seen to be uh, as a generally associated with being low in terms of its cultural value, um, or having low import compared, for instance, with uh, different types of culture that provide an intellectual kind of stimulation, which tend to be received as being higher or more important. The contrast between these is um, evidenced by something like classical music, which is uh, presumed to be intellectually stimulating, allowing you to um, dwell on life's philosophy and so forth, compared with dance music, which is designed to make you move your booty, as it were. So the body is typically associated with being low, and uh, because the horror is associated with the body, that's also presumed to be low. One way in which some filmmakers who take their art very seriously have sought to defend horror then is by suggesting that there is intellectual content underneath the gore or even the bodily responses of the audience. And the way in which I'm approaching that within the context of this lecture is to talk about the strategy of suggesting that horror films have some kind of political subtext. This is a common way in which the horror films are justified. Here are three examples to give you the sense of the kinds of political allegory I'm talking about. Um, them, made in 1954, on the surface is a film about giant ants attacking human beings. Um, underneath the surface, so it is argued, it's a film about um, uh, the Cold War, about the, the threat of radiation, of the threat of atomic attack. For the, um, according to that subtextual reading, for those people who are defending the film in that way, the ants are ants, but they also represent those kind of abstract fears that can't be embodied in any other way, and that's why they should be taken seriously. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is another film that's been interpreted um, according to an allegorical reading. Specifically, um, it's uh, supposedly on the surface about a group of teenagers who go out, out into the, uh, the outback um, in America and are attacked by a, a deranged family, but under the surface, allegedly, it's supposedly about um, America's incursions into Vietnam, and chiming to what Jamie was saying earlier, the family is supposed to represent the American government who are engaging in mindless, senseless violence with no end, and the teenagers are represent the counterculture who are being suppressed in their dreams of love and peace and so forth are being destroyed, as it were. Perhaps most famously, Dawn, um, Dawn of the Dead, made by George A. Romero in 1978, is supposedly about, not necessarily a political moment, but more a social and economic moment. On the surface, it's about, obviously, a zombie attack and survivors um, hiding in a shopping mall, but quite obviously within the text, it's supposedly about um, economic culture, the idea that the zombies are like us, that we go to shopping malls on weekends, we don't really know why, we have unquenchable desires, and we just keep going through those kind of routines. These are some famous examples of that way of defending horror as having an allegorical subtext of some kind. Those kind of readings have been defended 
um, by academics of various strands. Here are just some examples of the books that have taken that um, line in defending horror. Um, David J. Scowl's The Monster Show, Nightmares in Red, White and Blue, which uh, there was also a documentary made with the same title based on the book. Um, Kendall Phillips, Projected Fears, um, Adam Lowenstein's Shocking Representations, uh, Linny Blake's The Wounds of Nations, we won't talk too much about that because it's not very good. Nevertheless, this way of defending the horror film has a long lineage within academic circles and it's helped to give horror uh, a more grounded reputa reputation, specifically because academia is associated with being high-minded. So it's attaching that notion of intellectual stimulation to the horror film via academia. I can't criticize too much, this is the kind of work that I do. What I'm going to focus on as a case study um, to maybe point out some of the flaws or problems with that way of defending horror is the subgenre torture porn. Um, for the purposes of this talk, torture porn is, uh, refers to a body of films such as Saw and Hostel and The Human Centipede and the Serbian film and so on and so forth, made roughly speaking between the years 2003 and 2013, if we want to put a decade span on it. About 200 films have been labelled torture porn in the critical press. Um, of those 200, basically the only thing that they have in common is that there's either an individual protagonist or a small group of protagonists who are captured by a sadistic abductor, placed in a small confined space and tormented for the majority of the runtime of the film. That's what I'm referring to as torture porn for the sake of this talk. The way of defending those films, which again are associated with the body because they dwell on torture and so, and so have been derided by the critical press. The phrase porn um, comes into the, um, the coining of, of the name around torture porn is supposedly to suggest that that kind of um, way of treating the body is titillating, it's salacious, it's uh, gratuitous and unnecessary. The way of defending that, um, again, is to suggest that there's some intellectual content underneath the gore, underneath the, uh, the horror that ensues within these films. Most commonly, the way of defending these films is to present a political allegorical reading, which is to suggest that these films are really about um, post 9-11 politics and the war on terror specifically. Now, when I say the war on terror, that encompasses a number of different um, facets within American culture at the time. Most obviously, I'm referring to the Bush administration's torture sanctions. Um, they, uh, as, as I'll keep referring to them uh, throughout this talk, the enhanced interrogation techniques that were uh, supposedly um, uh, sanctioned by the Bush administration during this era. There are a number of other uh, locations and events that I'm going to be referring to, so I thought I'd flag them as part of what I'm referring to by the War on Terror. One is the Abu Ghraib scandal, and if you don't know what Abu Ghraib is, it's a prison facility um, run by the US military in which um, uh, detainees were tortured and uh, were humiliated, often in sexual scenarios, um, in a way that ex far exceeded the Bush administration's and the CIA's um, torture enhanced interrogation remit. So these, uh, this included stripping down prisoners, um, having dogs barking at them, um, arranging them into nude pyramids and so forth. The reason that we know about this is because, and um, the reason it became a scandal is because uh, the um, military personnel that were running the facility, thought it'd be a great idea to take photos of the, the torture that was ensuing there, usually with them stood in front of it going, as these terrible things were happening to the detainees and the photos got leaked. And it became a flashpoint for the war on terror discourse because um, it, be it became a talking point as to whether the torture that was happening in these facilities was um, acceptable or otherwise. Another key location that I'll be referring to is Guantanamo Bay, which again is a US run um, facility designed with enhanced interrogation in mind. It's a non-location in the sense that if American citizens were arrested and placed into Guantanamo Bay, they'd no longer have their rights as American citizens, and therefore any kind of torture would be acceptable within the walls of Guantanamo Bay. Um, similarly, just a, a prison facility then in that case. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the war on terror more generally. Now, that kind of way of defending these films has been... Uh, uh, proposed not only by um, print critics and academics, uh, especially French critics seem to latch onto this way of thinking and defending um, torture porn, but also filmmakers including Rob Zombie and uh, Joe Lynch and so forth. One of the most prominent figures that defended that way of um, understanding torture porn is Eli Roth, and he, he is talking on a news programme about the film Hostel specifically and Hostel's success in those terms. 
it made everyone stop and go, what is going on in America? And suddenly I got to go on this platform and say that, well, I think that what George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney are doing, everyone in America obviously wants to scream. And people were like, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, well, this film is clearly about American domination, Americans feeling like they have power. And suddenly it really woke people up a lot of people that had never thought of horror movies in that way, that your film could be not just a scary, entertaining movie, but actually could have a lot of political and social commentary layered underneath it. Now, in, uh, he's trying to defend his film in exactly the terms I've been outlining so far. In typical Eli Roth fashion, he's presenting it as if he's the first person to ever think of this and as if he's invented this kind of um, political allegorical meaning that's typical of the way he operates. Um, but... It's a, it's a way of capturing that filmmakers are also seeking to position their films as if they have this political subtext and that's what makes them worthwhile. Now, a number of the films of this era clearly do map into um, the political context of the era. One of those films is Territories, and I wanted to play a clip from Territories so that you can see exactly how it's mapping out. The film Territories is centred around these two antagonists, who you'll see in a moment, who are framed as being patriotic since they're saluting to the flag. This is the way in which this, is, this film is explicitly connected to the, um, the political moment, as it were, directly in the film itself. One that recognized the imperative of closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay. The best way to ensure security is to respect human rights standards and uphold the rule of law. They open things, they close things. So these two individuals who are living in the backwoods in America hear that Obama's proposing to close Guantanamo Bay, and on the basis of that, they seem to take it upon themselves to continue the good work that they see was happening in Guantanamo Bay. And because they live near a border checkpoint and they, a family tries to cross the border, one of whom looks to be of Middle Eastern origin, they decide to, after a series of escalating um, in, infractions with these people, kidnap them and to continue to work as a kind of mini Guantanamo Bay that they have in the woods um, by their houses. Sir, sir, please, this is all pointless. Sir, please, sir, you have to let us go, sir. So this is an example of the kind of torture they subject them to within a container that's supposedly like a little mini Guantanamo Bay that doesn't really exist anywhere in which the citizens here have no rights anymore, in which their the understanding of the world outside can be deprived from them. There's a sensory deprivation element to them being contained in a, a locker with no windows. Uh, the, the kinds of torture they're subjected to here in this clip um, before they're interrogated were exactly the kinds of torture being used within Guantanamo Bay is to sensorily stimulate so that when they begin to physically harm them or question them, they're either confused or more sensitive to the kinds of torture that were, um, they'd be subjected to. So this film clearly maps a connection between Guantanamo Bay and the events and uses this as a kind of little microcosm of Guantanamo Bay to question what is happening in Guantanamo Bay in the period and whether it's acceptable. The reason why this film works in that way is because it's trying to question the ways in which the Bush administration were defending um, the types of enhanced interrogation techniques they were employing in order to find the information that they wanted to obtain. This is a clip, this is the most disgusting thing I'm going to show you, as Russ has already alluded to, of Dick Cheney seeking to defend what Guantanamo Bay was, what he's going to refer to is directly Guantanamo Bay. 25% of the detainees, uh, 25% turned out not to have, it turned out to be innocent. They so were, where, really, where are you going to draw the line, Chuck? How well, are you going to know? You. I, is I'm, that I'm too saying, high? Is that, you're okay with that margin for I us? have no problem as long as we achieve our objective. And our objective is to get the guys who did 9-11 and it is to avoid another attack against the United States. Now, this way of speaking about torture was tied explicitly into the political moment. It was part of the, the rights um, campaign for s defending torture by saying, we need to do whatever it takes, no matter how inhumane it might seem, in order to prevent another 9-11 happening, because what we're doing is better than having another 9-11. Um, the way in which the, 
that discourse propagated was that the left started to react against it and say, you can't possibly think this is okay. The right responded by presenting hypothetical examples such as that that was mapped out by uh, Robert Beecher in his book, um, the, tick, the Torture and the Ticking Time Bomb, in which he presents this hypothetical, it, politicians such as Dick Cheney present these hypothetical examples about a ticking time bomb to, in, order to, in order to persuade the left that torture must be okay. And the hypothetical example goes something like this, that there is a bomb in a major American city. Uh, we know that there is a bomb. We have proof that there is a bomb. We have the person who says that they planted the bomb in custody, but they're not telling us where it is. What do we do if we're running out of time? And it must be obvious that we have to do whatever it takes in order to save thousands of people's lives. Some people have been convinced by that way of thinking that, okay, we, in those circumstances, those extreme circumstances, anything goes. Other people began to push back against it. The reason I'm talking about that um, particular way of thinking is because of another film that directly chimes into that discourse, and this is the film Unthinkable from 2010. Now I'm going to play you a series of clips from the film um, that span across the film so you can get a sense of how that discourse is playing out within the film itself. What is this place? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. Neither do we. I have placed three bombs in three American cities. I have demands which will be met by you or these bombs will explode. On Friday the 21st, at noon, Pacific time. Jesus, that's only four days from now. People, if there's a 1% chance the threat is serious, this is 100%. Mr. Younger, my name is H. I'm going to be conducting your interrogation from here on out. Oh my God. Constitutional. Ellen, if those bombs go off, there will be no fucking constitution. You want to know where the bombs are or not? It's my responsibility. This is war. This is sacrifice. You might not crack. There's only three hours left. For God's sake, we have no time. Just do what you have to do. What I have to do, Agent Brody, is... unthinkable. Bring me the children. His two kids against thousands of ours. Justify me. Tell me it's okay. Now this film plays out exactly that ticking bomb scenario, quite literally, but it keeps making reference to we're running out of time, there's only three hours left, do what you have to do. And this film maps out exactly the political discourse that was being propagated at the time. This is war, this is sacrifice, we must do what we need to do. Um, even the um, discussion of the children using innocence and saying, okay, is these two people against thousands of others, does that make it okay, was part of the political discourse in the era. In fact, I used to show this film to my students after making them read Beecher's book, and they were like, Jesus Christ, it's just like somebody's read this book and turned it into a screenplay, it's really lazy. But this is the way in which this film is clearly interacting with um, the political discourse of the era. So what I'm not, I don't want to suggest that all political allegorical readings are rubbish. There are clearly some films that are seeking to engage directly um, in political discussion in order to stimulate people who wouldn't read the political discourse into thinking, well, what would be acceptable under these circumstances? This is kind of like a philosophical thought experiment in action, as it were. However, there are a number of problems with the political allegorical reading that I wanted to flag because I think we need to be very careful when making these sharp connections. 
The first of the problems might not be apparent at first, and that's that this reading of these films has been repeated so often that that in itself becomes a problem. Here are just five books, the uh, academic texts, that use that these films are about 9-11 way of thinking into understanding these films and suggesting that they're worthwhile. There are dozens of other academic articles that do the same thing. There's nothing wrong with any one of these books or any of the chapters in these books or any one of the journal articles in and of itself. The problem comes from the repetition of that idea. It's repeated so often. There are the, I think there are hundreds of ways of reading any one individual film. When we're talking about 200 films, there are millions of ways of reading those films. The problem is that this seems to be the only one that's used to justify commonly that these films are worthwhile in any sense. My concern is that by repeating this um, way of understanding these films, it doesn't just become one way of interpreting these films, it becomes the way of interpreting these films to the exclusion of all the other meanings. The second problem with that repetition is evident by the ways in which the discourse of fiction and real politics become skewed. The idea that these films are about 9-11 becomes so obvious that it begins to become blurred with the real world. And that's obvious in something like this. This is Peter Whittle's article from the Times um, in England, which is about, directly, Eli Roth. But in the same breath that Peter Whittle mentions Eli Roth's films, he also talks about Al-Qaeda beheading videos as if they're the same thing. And clearly they are not the same thing in the sense that Eli Roth's films are fictional and Al-Qaeda beheading videos are not made for entertainment, they're made for a political purpose and someone actually died. To conflate those two things together seems extraordinarily dangerous to me. And that's part of the reason why I'm so concerned by the way in which this discourse has been propagated. Another example of how this operates is in Rosie D'Amano's article in the Toronto Star, um, in which she doesn't refer to uh, fictional films at all. She's only talking about the Abu Ghraib photographs, but she refers to those photographs as torture porn, and that was a phrase that was coined directly to refer to a set of fictional films. By conflating the real political world and these fictional films together in this kind of confused way, we lose sight of the differences and the distinctions between those uh, two sets of visual entertainment, as it were. The third problem, then, is that because the understanding that these films are about 9-11 becomes so obvious, there are a number of critics who start to be very lazy about making those connections. Um, those, those connections become quite crass and superficial. For any of you who haven't read Douglas Kellner's Cinema Wars, I would suggest that you don't read it at any point because it's, I don't care if Douglas Kellner's here. This book is rubbish. This is not a book for reading. It's a book for laying down and avoiding. The tone of this book is so crass that he just makes the most remarkably superficial connections and doesn't really give you any other content to justify this connection between the films and the real world. Here's one example, and this is a couple of pages into the book. He suggests that the Saw series, which is here represented by Tobin Bell, who plays the antagonist Jigsaw or John Kramer, must be about 9-11 because John Kramer looks a little bit like Dick Cheney, and that's it. Now, I don't think these two people look that similar. I mean, they're both older white dudes, but that's about it. And there's nothing else to it. He doesn't go on to say anything else about Saw. He doesn't say what we're supposed to learn from Saw by this superficial nonsense, or what even we're supposed to learn about 9-11 from making this kind of superficial connection. And he doesn't feel like he has to, because it's so obvious that those two things connect together. He doesn't need to do any more justificatory work. As I say, don't read it. Cinema Wars, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Those kind of superficial connections pervade this type of literature. And it's, in some ways, it becomes quite seductive as a way of mapping the connections between the real political sphere and the films of the era. So there are a lot of um, images that become associated with Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and the War on Terror. And um, those feature in some of these films, and that's why I think they get called torture porn eventually. For instance, there's um, gas masks feature in the films like The Tortured and The Final and so forth quite prominently, and they're more broadly associated with war. But more specifically, um, black hoods feature in a lot of the films. You've already seen uh, a black hood being taken off a, a detainee in Unthinkable, but all the detainees in, in sort of concrete bunkers in Nine Dead also wear those black hoods. And those black hoods became synonymous with imagery from um, Abu Ghraib at the time. Or there are uh, a number of detainees who wear orange jumpsuits, as you've already seen from the film Territories, or 
They feature also for the detainees in a film like Breathing Room, which have been associated with the images of Guantanamo Bay. And the problem with these, making these superficial connections between types of iconography is that we lose perspective on the history of that iconography. So, for instance, sure, black hoods were associated with the images coming out of um, Abu Ghraib, for instance, but the CIA have been using black hoods in their torture operations since at least the 1950s. So to say that Nine Dead must be about 9-11 because the captives are wearing black hoods seems to be incredibly superficial to me and doesn't really give me any sense of the history of that iconography. And this leads me to a, yet another problem with making these kind of sharp connections, and that's that they suffer from a kind of historical blindness. I'm going to pause here to play you a clip from Saw 2. This is just one of the traps picked almost at random. I'm sure you've all seen a Saw film, so you know what the routine is like, but here's um, the way in which Saw typically unfolds. The device around your neck is a death mask. The mask is on a spring timer. If you do not locate the key in time, the mask will close. Think of it like a Venus flytrap. What you are looking at right now is your own body, not more than two hours ago. Don't worry, you're sound asleep and can't feel a thing. Taking into account that you are at a great disadvantage here, I am going to give you a hint as to where I've hidden the key. So listen carefully. The hint is this. It's right before your eyes. <laughs> How much blood will you shed to stay alive, Michael? Live or die? Make your choice. Now, from the, the Dick Cheney reading, as it were, we have the puppet who looks a bit like Dick Cheney or something. And this is about people being kept in concrete bunkers where anything can happen to them for seemingly no reason at all because the people in charge of the torture are sadistic maniacs and there's a ticking clock and someone's got to escape and they can't and so on and so forth. Quite what we learn about 9-11 based on this, I do not know. When I first saw this film, I wasn't reminded of 9-11 at all. What I was reminded of was the abominable Dr. Fibes from 1971. And if you haven't seen the film, hopefully this clip will illustrate why I thought of that film. That is an x-ray of your son's rib cage. You will see from it that a tiny key has been lodged close to his heart. It will unlock the halter around your son's neck. I suggest you look above his head, doctor. In a few moments, acid will be released into that tube. It will take six minutes to reach the outlet over his face. Exactly six minutes. So here we have a sadistic maniac with a very elaborate torture setup with a timed trap and so forth, that torturing people in this ludicrous way. And I can understand why critics of the period, especially in the press, aren't making the connection between this and Saw, because they don't necessarily care about horror and they don't necessarily have the cultural knowledge to make those kind of connections. But I would say the connection between this and that Saw trap are much more obvious than they are between the, what's happening in Saw and the political moment. When I was writing my book about torture porn, I came to the, the premise thinking, well, okay, the only thing I've heard anyone say about torture porn in defense of torture porn is this 9-11 thing, and there must be more to it than that. There absolutely must be. And I started watching the films, and I encountered films like Unthinkable and Territories, and I thought, well, okay, fair enough, these are about 9-11. And then I started noticing more and more the, the black hoods and the orange jumpsuits, and I thought, well, maybe there is more to this. And it, I, as I say, it was quite seductive to make those connections between the iconography and the political moment. There is one film that completely changed my view, and I completely reversed. And I'm going to tell you the plot of that film before telling you what it is. In the film, one single man is abducted, he's tied to a chair, and he's tortured for the entire length of the film by two women. That is the entire plot. There are sexual overtones to the torture. He's in his underwear for the majority of the film. They are dressed like dominatrices or dominatrixes. I don't know what the plural would be, because I'm a good boy. Um, but there are sexual overtones to the torture throughout. So, so far, so torture porny. The captors make explicit references to serving their nation into terrorism, and the film was so controversial that it was banned in the UK, as many of the torture porn films were. Now, 
The problem that we have here is the film I'm referring to is A Boy Meets Girl, which was made, it was a British film made in 1994. The problem is that if this film were made in 2004, everyone would say, it's about 9-11, it's definitely about 9-11, look at all this stuff, it's definitely torture porn, and clearly it is not. It has nothing to do with 9-11 because it precedes 9-11 by such a wide margin. The problem is that those films that we say, oh, that's about 9-11 because of these different tropes that we're expecting to see in them, aren't necessarily about 9-11, but are about something much broader. What Boy Meets Girl about is, is about and why it has all these tropes is about a long legacy of torture and of war. And I would argue that that's what all the, these torture porn films are doing more broadly. In fact, even though Eli Roth suggests that his film, Hostel, is about 9-11, I think he's underselling what the film actually does. I suspect that his film was critically panned as being gory and rubbish by some critics. There were some French critics who said, actually, I think it's about 9-11. And he said, yes, that's a good defence. I'm going to leap on that. And then suddenly he's invented this way of thinking about his own film. But the film itself belies that way of thinking. Here's a clip from towards the end of the film where you're going to see the protagonist, Paxton, being taken away to be tortured. So as he's being dragged along, he sees a litany of torches on either side of the corridor is uh, proceeding to what he's going to suffer later on. Um, if I were reading this with my 9-11 hat on, I would say, well, it looks quite like the Abu Ghraib facility, I suppose. It's a facility that's designed just to torture people, so it's about 9-11. However, earlier in the film, we have this scene, which again features the same protagonist, Paxton. Hey, Josh. See you. In which the characters go in to visit a museum of torture. And clearly this is a parallel scene for what we get later on. They're moving around the same sort of concrete facility corridor where they're seeing a litany of objects that could be used to torture. And later on we see that in action, whereas they're for their own entertainment, looking at these torture devices at this stage, later they come to realise what it means if you're actually tortured in these ways. What this suggests is that torture is a sustained part of human history. It's not about just 9-11. It's not like suddenly torture is new. Torture isn't even new in horror, as Dr. Fibes suggests, right? This is a sustained part of human history such that there can be a museum that's devoted just to torture implements. So I would argue that what Eli Roth is doing is underselling what the film is actually about, which is much broader than just this small political moment. More broadly, I think the connotations of torture porn, especially the associations between sex and violence, also undersell what the film is about. Um, and some of this ties into what um, Kate was saying about the video nasties, because I think there are some ways in which the torture porn films are just doing what the video nasties were doing. But I think we can step back even further than that. Let me again describe a plot to you. This is the story plot some of you might recognise. In the story, a girl is raped and her assailants are such that they cut off her hands and her tongue to stop her from identifying them. So she can't speak their names, she can't point to them. Nevertheless, her father finds out that she's been raped and she decides to take revenge against them. She does that by slitting the rapist's throats and, in a gruesome turn, his daughter holds a bowl underneath their throats to catch the blood and she has to hold it between her bloody stumps because she doesn't have hands anymore. Now, if this were made in the early 2000s, we would say, well, this sounds like the latest Tom Six film or maybe an Eli Roth film. What I'm referring to, obviously, is Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, which was written in 1590. There is a tendency for critics of every period to suggest that things are terrible now and this is the worst it's ever been and horror's so gruesome now and it's so sexual now, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, it's not that simple because this kind of horror has a long legacy and I would argue this is more graphic and disturbing than anything that I saw within the torture porn era. So what we need to start thinking about is those broader concepts of sex and violence and how they come together in a more sustained way and we need historical knowledge in order to do that. So in conclusion, I'm not trying to rubbish the political allegorical reading altogether. It can be useful, but it's a tool that needs to be wielded carefully because if we don't wield it carefully, what we end up doing is mapping 
things that we're expecting to see onto these films in a very superficial way and that leads to superficial understandings of the films and it also is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where we go in expecting to see something therefore we see it and that's no way to interpret what the films actually have to say to us thank you very much <laughs>